Following All Cars, the presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 57, regarding a suspicious person. Suspect described as short, fat, dressed in a red suit trimmed with white fur, has a ruddy complexion, white beard, twinkling blue eyes. This suspect was seen climbing down a chimney with a sack over his shoulder. Go get him, boy. That's all. Rose and put. At the darkest hour of Christmas night, just before dawn, a roving police car strikes an automobile parked at an awkward angle on a dark street. Suspicious, they draw up behind. What's the matter, buddy? Police officers. Say, I'm glad to see you. I'm out of gasoline. How about giving me a lift to a gas station? Well, you'd have a long walk back this time in the morning, old man. But we've got a reserve can here. Reach back there and help yourself. Say, that's great. <laughs> You know, I passed an all-night station not long ago, but I didn't like the gas they sold, so I took a chance. There's only one kind of gasoline that works right in my car. Did you ever use Rio Grande crank gasoline before? That's what you're pouring in right now. Well, that is luck. You know, Rio Grande is the only gasoline I use. But that's right, I remember. All your police cars use Rio Grande crack gasoline, don't you? You bet we do. And we feel the same way about it you do. No other gasoline can equal Rio Grande crack for police work. No fun. It certainly does make a difference in my car's performance. If I use any other gasoline, my car acts sluggish. Your car's no more temperamental than these police cruisers. When we step on the gas, we step all the way down. Ordinary gasoline would choke and sputter. But with Rio Grande crack, we just step right out. Well, here's your can, fellas. You sure were lifesavers. Well, how much do I owe you? Oh, it's a gift. It's a gift. <laughs> this is the holiday season. Just return the favor to the next fellow you see who needs gas. Tell him to use Rio Grande crack, too. And now we are pleased to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, I joined the Rio Grande Oil Company in sending you the season's greetings. May the joys of this holiday season be multiplied and increased for you through the year to come. This festival of peace is no time to remember the strife that so often is a part of life. We feel that at this happy time, you do not want to be reminded how far men sometimes wander from peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Your police officer is a peace officer. His duty is to keep the peace. Beyond and above the call of duty, he often gives his life that the peace of the community may be preserved. These are the more spectacular instances. But every day in every city in the land, police officers perform acts of kindness, of humanity, of courage, which never appear in the public press, and reports of which seldom appear even on the police blotters. It is to this, this human side of the cop, that we turn our attention tonight. From several western cities, we have selected incidents in which the policeman has been your friend, an officer of the peace. Your policeman lives constantly with the ideal, peace on earth, goodwill towards men. <laughs> It is a warm summer evening in San Francisco. Officer George Guyman, off duty and out of uniform, steps into a candy store to make a telephone call as he leaves the phone booth. Well, what's the matter with you, little girl? Come on, tell me, what's the trouble? Are you all alone? Yes, I'm all alone. Well, is that so tough? You've got a bag of candy there. It looks good, too. I've got some candy, but, but now I can't go to the show. 
Why not? Well, he gave me fifteen cents for the show, and I spent it all for the candy. Well, that is sort of tough. And there's a sneaky mouse in the silly symphony, too. Gosh, that's tragic. Look here, I'll tell you what. My girl just broke a date on me. Will you let me take you to the show? Will you let you? Really? Sure. Give him my candy then, if you like. <laughs> That's well. Come on. The show is swell. Little Edith and her escort have a grand time. And the Mickey Mouse and Silly Symphony are so funny that Edith has to stay through the second show to see them again. It is way past nine o'clock when the pair emerge from the theater. Well, Edith, it's pretty late for little girls to be out alone. You live far from here? Oh, five or six blocks. You better let me drive you home in my car. Oh, no, I couldn't let you do that. Why not? Oh, I'm not allowed. What do you mean, you're not allowed? Hmm, my mother always told me not to take rides with strange men. Oh, well, Edith, you're perfectly safe with me. I- I'm a policeman. A policeman? Mm-hmm. You're not fooling. No, I'm not, really. Then show me your star. There it is. Well, I... It looks like a real policeman star, all right. <laughs> Bet your life it is. But if you're a policeman, why haven't you got a uniform on? Well, you see, Edith, I'm not on duty. Policemen only wear uniforms when they are on duty, but they wear their stars always. Oh, I didn't know that. Come on, you better let me drive you home. Oh, well, if you're a policeman, I guess Mother wouldn't mind. I guess it's all right. <laughs> And there's my mother on the porch. No, Mommy! Oh, Edith! Oh, my dear! Thank heaven you're safe. Oh, sure, I'm all right, Mommy. Well, who's this man? I thought I told you never to take a ride with a strange man. Oh, he isn't strange. He's a policeman. He took me to the show and... But I gave you money for the show. Well, well, I spent the money for candy. And I happened to see your little girl crying in the candy store, so I asked her to be my guest at the movies. Well, that's... That's very kind of you, sir, but we've been so worried. I've already called the police and asked them to look for Edith. Well, I thought she might be kidnapped. Well, she wanted to see the Mickey Mouse again. Oh, gee, Mother, oh, swell. Mickey Mouse was in an airplane and Pluto and the only fell out. Oh, me. darling, you can tell me that later. It's time for you to go to bed now. Oh, Mother, I want to talk to Mr. Policeman a while. Not tonight, dear. Oh, I must call the station and tell him you're all right. Well, don't bother yourself, ma'am. I'll cancel the call from the box on the corner. Oh, thank you. Yes, and, and thank you for being so kind, really. Not at all. My girl stood me up tonight, but I had more fun taking Edith to the movies than I'd have had with her anyway. And will you come back again sometime and take me to the movies, Mr. Placement? Well, yes, I'd like to, if, if it's all right with your mother. Well, of course it is. Gee, that's swell. Only, uh... Mr. Policeman? Yes? Well, the next time you come, could you wear your uniform? It is a few days before Christmas last year. Into a little drug store in the southwest section of Los Angeles steps Mr. L. M. Reedy. Good afternoon, Mr. Reedy. Hello, Jack. You got that uh, prescription filled yet? Yeah, I think Ed's just finishing it. Mm. Hey, Ed, got Mr. Reedy's prescription? Yeah, be ready in a minute. Bobby got the croup again, huh? <laughs> no, but I just want to have some cough medicine along in case he gets wet feet. Wet feet? Why, where are you going? I'm taking the family up to Arad for Christmas. Oh. A friend of mine lent me his cabin. Say, that'll be fine. They tell me there's a lot of snow up there now. Mm, yes, so I understand. Bobby will love it. He's never seen snow, you know. Sure, we'll get a kick out of it then. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll have an old-fashioned Christmas. I'm even taking a Santa Claus suit now. I'll see whether I can get down the chimney or not. <laughs> Better take this box of reducing pills if you're going to tap that. <laughs> oh, fine. 
Well, the family's waiting outside in the car. They're in a hurry to get away. How much is it? That'll be one dollar fifteen cents, Mr. Reedy. One dollar fifteen. All right, there you are. Thanks, and Merry Christmas to you. Oh, same to you both. Merry Happy Christmas. New Year. Thanks. He's a nice guy, isn't he? Yeah, swell fella. And is he in love with that kid of his, Bobby? Mm. Devoted father, huh? I'd say so. He thinks the sun rises and sets on that kid. Uh, makes me wish I had one of my own. <laughs> well, I'd better get a that prescription for Dr. Thompson. Hmm. Ed? Yeah? Come here. What is it? Is this the alcohol you use in Mr. Regis' medicine? Yeah, sure. Why? Can't you read this label? Oh, my God. It's wood alcohol. Stop him. Don't let him get away. Okay. Mr. Regis! Mr. Reedy! Mr. Reedy! It's too late! He's gone! Los Angeles police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Be on the lookout for an automobile described as a 29 green Chevrolet sedan. Containing a man, woman, and a child. The name of the driver, L. M. Reedy. This car is believed to be headed for Lake Arrowhead on the Valley or Foothill Boulevard. Stop this car. Mr. Reedy was sold some medicine in which wood alcohol was placed by mistake. This is urgent. All cars be on the lookout for this automobile. We are now checking Sacramento for the license number. Stand by for that information. <laughs> All over Los Angeles, radio patrol cars scan the heavy pre-Christmas traffic for the meagerly described automobile. The teletype flashes the message to the sheriff's substations, to San Bernardino, to Lake Arrowhead. The state motor patrol is notified. The Valley and Foothill Boulevards are watched for the green sedan. Motorcycle policemen stop the traffic in Waterman Canyon, gateway to Lake Arrowhead. A breathless two hours pass. And then on the Foothill Boulevard near Glendora, two officers in a patrol car... Here comes a green Chevrolet. Keep your eyes open. Ah, that won't be it. There's millions of green Chevrolet sedans. I found that out today. Wait a minute. There's a man and a woman and a kid in that one. And they got on wool caps. They look like they're going to the snow. All right, let's go then. Pull over. I, I, uh, I wasn't doing anything, officer. I, this old buggy can't go faster than 35. That's all right, mister. Is your name Reedy? I, uh, yeah, uh, what's the matter? Did you buy a bottle of cough medicine from a druggist before you left Los Angeles? Yeah. Well, I'm sure glad we found you. Let me have it. Why, uh, what's the matter? I, I need it in case Bobby catches cold. You won't want to give him this. Why not? Because they made a mistake when they filled the prescription. It contains wood alcohol. Good heavens. Oh, Lester, just think I wanted to give him some back in Monrovia. Uh, here, officer, you take the bottle. I, I don't even want it in the car. Thanks. We'll just make sure nobody gets a hold of this. Oh, officer... You've saved our boy's life. How can we ever repay you? Lester, we must do something for this officer. Forget it, lady. It's all in the day's work. Los Angeles police calling car 11, car 11. Five in spring, a woman threatened to jump off the building. Get on there, boy. Wild traffic at one of Los Angeles' busiest intersections is jammed with a morbidly curious mob. Car 11 screams through downtown streets. High above the crowd, the tiny woman's figure is blackly silhouetted against the noonday sky as she stands teetering on the corners of the building. Thirty seconds after the call is broadcast, radio car 11 is at the scene. An officer, W.L. Patterson, is shooting up the elevator to the roof. He rushes up the last flight of stairs and out onto the roof. Where is she? Over there on the edge. Don't go near her, officer. She'll jump. She means it. Hello there, lady. What are you doing out there? Go away. Don't you come near me. Now, you better be careful. You'll fall. I won't fall. I'm going to jump. Why? What's the matter? I'll die. I'll live it. Oh, now that's no way to I'll talk. you know. Well, come on over here, away from that ledge, and let's talk this thing no. over. I've thought it all out. I'm through with life. I'd be better off dead. Well, what's wrong with life? Everything. My husband's left me. I can't find work. There's nothing to live for. Well, you'll change your mind when you're halfway down, and then it'll be too late. I've never finished anything I ever started, but I'm going to finish this job, and I'm going to do it right now. Now, just a minute. You, you better think this thing over. I have. Here, look. I'll tell you what I'll do. 
I'll toss a coin whether you jump or not. What? Sure. You're a good sport, aren't you? Well, yes, I've always tried to be. Okay. Now, I'll toss a coin. If it comes up heads, you jump. If it's tails, you don't. How about it? Well, all right. I'll gamble with you. All right. I'll toss this quarter. Well, it fell on the roof. Yeah, what is it? Let me say no. Let me go. Let me go. Why did you let me jump? You wouldn't even let me finish this, would you? I'm sorry, ma'am, but it's against the law to take your own life. You can be arrested for it. Yeah, and you you hurt my head when you knocked me over. I beg your pardon for that, ma'am, but it really doesn't hurt as much as it would if you'd hit the street with it. <laughs> Officer Patterson's bravery in risking his own life to prevent another from taking hers causes much newspaper attention. Once quieted and cared for in the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, the attempted suicide is glad that she was deterred from self-destruction. And through the Missing Persons Bureau, the police department manages to find her lost husband and reunite the couple. Santa Barbara, there is a new chief of police. Jesse A. Butts believes in keeping the personal contact with the citizenry he protects. Recently, he had a very serious case to consider. What's the trouble, Sonny? I'm a me, Chief Butts. Well, no, he's pretty busy. Pretty busy right now. I gotta see him. I gotta have his help. Well, but you see, kid, the chief's awfully busy chasing robbers. Can't you tell me what the trouble is? No, I gotta see the chief. What's the trouble, Sergeant? A citizen here demanded to see you, Chief. I told him you were busy, but he won't take no for an answer. Okay, send him in. Right this way, kid. Are you really Chief Buck? Sure. Chief. Come on in and sit down. Well, now, let's have your story. What's your name? Johnny Burns. How old are you? Six. Going on seven. And what's your trouble? My dog floor. <laughs> well, maybe you come home. No. I don't think so. Oh, sure he will. No, I'm sure he won't. What makes you so sure? Well, you see, I haven't any license for him. Oh. But gosh, I'd be willing to get one. I could only find a job. So you're one of the army of unemployed, huh? What's that, Chief? I mean, you're out of work. Yes, sir. I ain't old enough to sell papers. The other kids that sell papers, gosh, they can earn money for the license. I see. Queenie's a good dog, Chief. She never hurt no one. Can't you get her back for me? Well, now, you wouldn't ask me to break the law, would you? No, not exactly. But I would like to get Queenie back. I don't care much how I do it. Well, come on. And we'll take a ride over to the pound in the police car and see what we can do about it. We're going in a real police car? Sure, sure enough. <laughs> sure enough, Johnny. Gee. <laughs> Johnny, do you see Queenie anywhere? She'll come running if she's there. There she is. Come here, Queenie. Hello, Queenie. Oh, get her for me, will you, Chief? Please get her for me. Well, we'll see what we can do. Oh, hold on, sir. There's Queenie. Uh, say, what's Johnny got to do to get his dog out of here? Well, how much is that? Two bucks. <laughs> well, here you are. Thanks, Chief. Just a minute, I'll put a license on her. Come on, Queenie. Get your license on your collar. Uh, there, there you are, Johnny. Thanks. Hey. Well, come on, Johnny. Now, where do you live? On the real street. Well, I'll take you home. Will you pull the siren open all the way? Okay, Johnny. Gee, Chief Buck, I want to thank you. That's all right, Sonny. Come on, now. Get in. San Diego police calling all cars. Attention all cars. A drunken man has stolen a black Studebaker sedan. License 8Z like zebra 8816. 8Z like zebra 8816. Get him quick, boy, before it crashes into someone. That's all. Officers DeWolf and Stevenson cruising about in a San Diego police car hear the warning to watch for a drunken driver. 
And almost before the end of the police broadcast, the heavy sedan tears toward them, weaving dangerously down the street. There he goes. Boy, is that guy drunk. We'll get him. I'll run him to the curb. Hang on. Yeah. But the crazed driver of the big sedan refuses to stop. He tears on at top speed, endangering pedestrians, narrowly missing other motors. Officers DeWolf and Stevenson cannot keep abreast of the fleeing car. The shrieking sirens and screaming brakes attract another police car containing officers Westerdahl and Agnew. They join the chase. Get up the gas, Agnew. we got to stop that fellow before he kills someone. Hey, look out. He's going to hit that streetcar. But the plunging sedan miraculously misses a crowded streetcar, veers to the wrong side of the street, and gets ahead of the police car. Officer Stevenson and DeWolf realize that unless the rolling juggernaut is stopped at once, a serious accident is inevitable. You'll have to shoot, Stevenson. But if I kill that driver, the car will run wild. It's wild anyhow. Hurry up, shoot. I'll shoot out in the air. Maybe you'll stop if he hears a few bullets. The other police car draws alongside, and seeing the desperate measures being taken by their brother officers, they too begin to shoot. But realizing that any second a crash might cost the lives of innocent persons, these officers attempt to get the driver first. That, that got him. Throw off that car's going to turn over. Come on, get him out quick. Come on, before that car catches fire. We'll put him in your car and rush him to the hospital. No time to call an ambulance. And while the officers are booking their wounded prisoner at the jail hospital, congratulating themselves on capturing the driver before his insane driving had killed or injured innocent bystanders, a call comes to the hospital. Hey, Stevenson. We just got a call to pick up a dead body at 11th and J Street. That's in your territory. Sure, that's right near where we got this crazy fool. How was this fellow killed? He was shot. He staggered into the quality creamery and they called a doctor. But the fellow died before he got there. Uh, sounds strange. Come on, DeWolf, let's hurry out and check on this. Detectives Jerry Leiter and E.A. Dykeman of the San Diego Police Detective Bureau joined the officers and the ambulance surgeon at the scene of the killing. Shouldering through the morbidly curious crowd, they interrogate the surgeon. I'm sorry I can't help you much. They called me and I got here in just a moment, but I couldn't save him. The bullet had penetrated his brain. Well, let's look for some kind of clues over here on the ground. Doctor, will you see if you can extract the bullet? Now, uh, any of you folks know anything about this man? Well, here's his father with his identification card, Slightly. Oh. And here's a couple of dollars. Oh. Doesn't look like robbery. Here's the bullet, Lieutenant. It was easy to reach, but it's a funny kind of bullet. It's all flat and bent. Oh, 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 I'm afraid I know the answer. Well, take the body away, Doctor. Come on, move on, you folks. Uh, the Wolf, you and Stevenson, come here with me, will you? Okay. Uh, listen, you fellas went right past here a little while ago chasing that drunk, didn't you? Yeah. We started shooting back there a ways. Officers Westerdahl and Agnew caught up with us back there, and they were shooting, too. We were shooting in the air until the last shot. We hit him with that. Well, here's where the man was standing. You can see the blood stains yet on the sidewalk. And the bullet went right through the top of his head. Must have come from above. Now look at this bullet. It's all flattened out and bent. And must have ricocheted. Say, do you suppose one of the bullets we fired in the air could have hit a building and ricocheted back to kill this man? Hey, look up there at that cornice. Huh? See that first scar? Could have hit it. It could have hit there and bounced over here and killed this innocent bystander. Hey, that's a terrible thing, but... Well, it could have happened. Of course, we're not actually responsible, but... It was entirely accidental. I don't like the job, but I'll go see this man's family. That evening, Detective Leitner comes into the San Diego police station and walks somberly up to the group of officers at the sergeant's desk. What's the matter, Jerry? Why the sad look? Boys, I like to think I'm a hard-boiled cop, but I feel so low now I'd like to cry. Oh, what's wrong? Can we help you? Uh, it isn't me, fellas. Remember that man killed today at 11th and J? Yeah. Well, he was killed by a policeman's bullet. Hmm? It was accidental enough. The bullet hit a stone cornice and ricocheted, so we're not technically responsible, but I was just calling his widow. It's a tough spot for her. She hasn't a cent. Her husband was out looking for a job when he got killed. And they've got two little youngsters, cute kids. I talk with them. They don't know their daddy's dead. I had to buy their dinner, not a bite in the house. What's going to happen to that woman, boys? Gosh, see, that. Uh, looks like we're morally responsible for her. Oh, come on, boys. Let's make up a purse. We can't let a widow and kids go hungry. Now, wait a minute. This takes more than a little, though. An innocent man is dead from a police bullet. Accidentally, I admit, but I feel it's up to us police to take care of that family's future. A few dollars won't release us from that responsibility. Yeah. Well, I guess you're right. Let me offer a suggestion. I'm president of the police relief. All you fellows pay money into the fund every month. What do you say we turn that money over to the widow? Yeah, but that's against the rules, Jobbins. The money we cops pay in the police relief is just for the families of police officers injured in line of duty. Now, well, don't you think if we asked the boys that they'd all vote to change the rules? During that night and the next day, the word spread from one man to another in the San Diego police force. The next day, Detective Joe Jobbins, president of police relief, received the unanimous vote of the entire police department, authorizing him to suspend the rules and do everything possible for the widow and her children. At the next meeting of the police relief, Detective Jobbins makes his report. Well, I've got bad news for you, men. You authorized me to take care of the family of that man who was accidentally killed by a police bullet. 
Well, I did. I've paid their rent, clothed them, buried the husband decently, and given the woman $500 in cash. A gentleman we haven't a cent left in the treasury. Ah, uh, who cares? Be quick, Joe. Oh, yeah. shucks, Joe. You're a piker. We're just starting. Yeah. I make a motion that the police believe take care of this family as long as they need help. Do I hear a second? Yeah, yeah. Second, motion. second that. All in favor, say aye. Aye! Such are the off-record activities of your police officers. Whenever trouble occurs, your first reaction is to call the police. And you would be astonished to know the variety of requests for aid which come over a police complaint board during the course of a day. It may be an old lady's escaped parrot whom the officers have to rescue from a tree, or a man who has lost the key to his own home who requests the policeman's assistance to make his entry legal. We return lost children to their parents, find missing dogs, advise transients on the best place to spend the night, help stall motorists start their cars, lend a stranded pedestrian car fare to get home, and on and on. Time does not permit me to enumerate the hundreds of various services your policemen perform and the cost of this service, a service which, like insurance, when you need it, you must have it. The cost, for example, in the city of Los Angeles is only one and a third cents a day per citizen. Think of that. Nine cents a week is all it costs you in taxes to ensure the peace of the community. I leave it to you whether it isn't worth a hundred times that. Thank you, Chief Davis. I have a letter here suggesting that the Rio Grande Oil Company give their thousands of independent dealers something for the holidays. Give them? What more can Rio Grande give them? Right now, they have the greatest value in gasoline on this market. Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline, the gasoline that gives police car performance, the gasoline that gives every car greater speed and greater power, the fastest-growing gasoline. And Rio Grande sells this gasoline at a competitive price. That means the independent dealer who sells Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline with tetraethyl offers a better value than his competitors. You're right. But there is one thing we can do that will make a lot of people happy. Let's send our Rio Grande dealers a lot of new gasoline customers. This big audience of ours is full of holiday spirit, aren't you? We want to be happy and to make other people happy. Don't you? Then will you drive into the service station in your neighborhood that sells Rio Grande cracked gasoline and tell them that you have listened to Calling All Cars tonight. And tell the owner of the station that you hear he has the best gasoline on the market and you want to experience some of that police car performance. That's the holiday spirit. Do a good deed and do yourself a favor at the same time. Los Angeles police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 57 regarding a man climbing down chimneys. The suspect in this case has been identified as Santa Claus. That's all. Rolls and quits. Next week, Calling All Cars offers an unusually good program. The most exciting scenes from last year's episode will be re-dramatized. A half hour packed with thrills and excitement. The most interesting moments of 1934. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, 